My guest today is one of the biggest potty mouths on the planet. But much like South Park, there's utter brilliance in this panorama of porcelain. Featuring monsters with rich backstories based on well-researched science, his books are absolutely tearing it up the charts. He is one of the very first and most successful patio book authors of all time, and the first to truly make it into the big time. So get ready for an interview that contains harsh language, adult situations, and lots and lots of violence. Join me in welcoming New York Times bestselling author, Scott Sigler. Scott? Howdy, man. Thanks for having me on. Hey, my pleasure. Always, always a good time to have you on the show. So, um, so you are one of the original three patio book authors, and yeah. you're the first to get as far as, as you've gotten. No one else has become a New York Times bestseller except for you so far. And so, so far, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that you, and I know this because we're friends, but you spent a lot of time beforehand uh, trying to get published, and you had a long road, I think a 10-year road, if I recall correctly. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, where you started? Because it wasn't just an overnight success. Well, I spent um, nine or 10 years trying to do this through the traditional route, which was going out and finding an agent, going to different conventions, trying to meet uh, editors and publishers in the genre world, and doing a lot of submissions, you know, building a database to track all the submissions to know when to uh, hit people up again, to retouch on them to see if they had the, had the book submissions. And uh, it was largely an exercise in futility, and I kept getting the same answer, which was, uh, we like the writing, we think it's a good story, but you combine too many genres and we really don't know what shelf to put it on. And that was, in a nutshell, that's, that's what I was told when I was rejected. What, genres, was rejected did they think that, what genres did they think that you were um, crossing between? It was a little tricky because I, at the time I had a, a science fiction agent, someone who knew that field very well, and the science fiction guys didn't really want me because it had too much horror in it or it was set in modern day. The horror guys didn't want me because it didn't have any you know, paranormal stuff in it and had too much actual science and sci-fi in it. It really just ran the gamut. They just kind of wanted something that was predictable. Right. And I was of the opinion that if I could just get it in front of the end reader, that the story would speak for itself and I would pick up followers. Yep. No, and you, you've proven that in spades. Um, so you, you, now, before you have the book deal you have now, which is with Crown Press, if, I, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, right? And you had, you had a deal before this, if I recall, back in the early 90s, or late 90s, if I, is that correct? There's been two, actually. I had one in the early 90s with the Time Warner imprint, and they were going to put out Earthcore. It was supposed to be out, I believe, in April of 2002, but the 9-11 recession hit, and Time Warner just scrapped everything that wasn't, uh, in, wasn't profitable at that moment. My imprint wasn't profitable. whole thing got shut down pretty much a week before the book was going to go to press, Right. Uh, so, so that wiped it out, and then looked around for another print deal for the next three years, till 2005 when I discovered podcasting, and that led to a deal with Dragon Moon Press out of Canada, who published Earthcore and Ancestor. Right. Okay. Now let's go back to the podcasting for a second. Now, how did you connect with the the uh, the patio book world and get involved with Evo Terra and you know get going in that? How did that happen for you? Well, I was um, I, I when I discovered podcasting. It was just, uh, I was with a company that did a lot of corporate recording. And one of the engineers came to me and said, you should look at this. This might be something we can use. So I started to, I started to take a look at it. And the first thing I thought of was, this is a great way to get serialized audiobook. Right. Went looking for them, couldn't find any. Literally after about two days of Googling different permutations of that, realized that nobody had done it yet. At least nobody was, uh, you know, uh, out online having done it where it was available. And then the marketing guy in me kicked in, said, if I, if I can be the first one to do this, I can get some media coverage and use the online links to, to quickly build up a fan base. Right. Just because, just by being unique. So I started to listen to other podcasts, looking for podcasts related to science fiction and horror, found the Dragon page with Evo Terra and Mike Menengay, and started listening to that. And then as I'm developing the podcast novel, uh, trying to figure out how to do that, came to find out that T. Morris is working on it too. And then, and then you and I connected as well. Next thing you know, all three of us are up on the Dragon page, T. Morris's Moravia, your pocket and pendant, and my Earthcore, and uh, we kind of invented a, a genre. Yeah, no, I, that was, uh, it's, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't quite sure actually how you, got, how you got connected with Evo, so obviously the rest of the story I'm familiar with, but um, so, so you get it up on, it becomes hugely popular on uh, actually Dragon page first, not really even patiobooks.com, and mm -hmm. then that leads to your first deal with Dragon Moon Press. Which is a how would you describe them? They're they're the small mid sized press, something like that. they they at the time they were very small Canadian press. Uh, Gwen Gettys ran it. Yep. And uh, T. Morris introduced me to her. 
and tease books were selling more because of the podcast. And uh, my first thought was, if I can just sell Earthcore before the, the full podcast run is complete, at least get pre-orders in, I thought I could sell a lot of books. And we did. We sold, for an indie book, we sold a lot of copies of Earthcore, but then uh, was able to ramp up a lot more for Ancestor and kind of understanding the online world, understanding how Amazon works, we were able to do really well with, with Ancestor. And we hit, uh, we were the number two fiction book overall only behind Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. That's we were only there for a couple of days, but that was still a pretty big friggin' deal for a tiny little Canadian imprint. No advertising, no promotion, no PR, not even in stores to be able to pull that off. Now, were you available on bookshelves like Barnes & Noble when you, when you had a Dragon Moon press deal, or was that not, were you not uh, on those shelves? No, we weren't. I mean, just a handful of stores, a couple in Canada, one, at least one in America, I know, because I went and gave them the books. But uh, just it was all an online... It was all an online phenomenon. We weren't, they did not have the clout to get a distribution deal and to get into stores. Right. So did, did you have an agent when you had the Dragon Moon deal? I did. I had an agent. His name uh, was Joshua Bilmis out of New York. He's a very successful uh, science fiction agent and just an awesome, awesome guy. He, um, the, the Suki Stackhouse novels, that's one that's of his him. Books. Yeah, that's him. I mean, the people who have made the True Blood series, that's based on books by one of his, by one of his clients, by Charlene Harris. So, right. Um, he's really well known in the space, but and he liked my stuff. We just couldn't, we just couldn't connect uh, to find an editor who could see the thriller side of horror and science fiction. Right. So he and then he just, you know, I got the deal with Drag Moon. And basically, I said, I've I've got this deal. I want to do this. Take a look at the contract. Make sure it's okay. So you know, that's how it went. And so then, and then what happened was you got a new agent, I think. And mm -hmm. then you, and so tell me, you know, what what? So you, you basically decided to switch things up. To, you weren't you weren't reaching level of success that you thought you could and you, yeah. it turns out you were totally right and so you switched up agents so, so tell me about that process and then what happened from there well I was with uh, Jabberwocky Joshua's agency for nine years and um, they I mean again they were just phenomenal like they kept getting the book in front of different people but the people they were getting in front of it, it was the sci-fi slash horror crowd and, and fantasy crowd and they, they just couldn't see the connection right. so I left Joshua got a new agent um, uh, with the help of Mark Fraunfelder and Corey Doctorow, um, his name is Bird Level of the Jabberwock, or excuse me, of the Waxman Agency in New York. And Bird had just, you know, it's publishing is a small world, but Bird had a different set of connections. He was much more in tune with the thriller community. So then he took Infected, got that on the, on like 20 new desks in New York. About half of them were immediately interested in it and, and were considering making an offer. And some of the people had even read it like the same day they got it. Oh, wow. Which was shocking. One lady had stayed up all night to read it and was making an offer the next day. So a lot of times it can just be, you know, you don't have the right fit, even though it's, and it's got nothing to do with the story. It's got nothing to do with the agent. It's just not the right connections are being made. Right. And right when, right when that happened... When all these new people had the book who hadn't seen it before and offers were, were starting to, you know, just kind of vaguely talk about maybe we'll make an offer, that's when Ancestor went up to number two in fiction. And uh, uh, the New York, New York publishers just lost their little minds, basically. Just uh, they thought because they had a book they liked, they thought this was cool. Then all of a sudden, this author is able to sell a lot of books without any help from them at all. And uh, they got really excited about that. Yeah, it's sort of the perfect. They'd never seen that phenomenon before. That was, I think you were the first one to sort of do that Amazon you know, you use your fan base to basically, you know, bang the drum and drive the book right. up. So. There were people who've done it in business and nonfiction, but it was, um, it, it's more of a, a trick or a gimmick that I don't really understand, which is you get, you know, these networks of hundreds of business blogs and you kind of get, get everybody blogs about everybody else's book and it's this little incestuous community, but it's able to push a book up really fast. Right. Whereas, yeah, all of my stuff was straight, straight from the fan base. It was yeah. just saying, you guys have been enjoying these free podcasts for a while. If, if you want to see me go to the next step, go buy the book on April 1st, 2007, and that's what they did. Yeah, so it was great that you were able to actually you know, basically issue a, a request to your fan base, and they all at one time go out and buy your book. That's, I mean, that, I don't, authors haven't had that kind of power before the Internet, so that's really a new phenomenon that you pioneered there, I think. Mm -hmm, um, I think you were the first person to really do it, so, well, certainly successfully. Yeah. Um, so what does it take to be a New York Times best-selling author? When you, when you got the deal with uh, your current publisher, Crown, um, how much did they do for you and how much did you do for yourself? And you know, what, what do you think helped push you up to the stratosphere? Well, they did quite a bit for, uh, for Infected. Um, 
I'm still not convinced that the stuff they did really impacted sales all that much. Publishing in general is having a really difficult time figuring out what's going to move the needle and, and where their dollars are going to be well spent. So it's, it's not just me. It's all over the place. They just, they're just they not really sure where to spend their, their marketing money to get a return on it. But they, they did a, a lot. And they sent out a lot of galleys. The editing team worked really hard to get blurbs, try, try and get media coverage. They got me in Entertainment Weekly. They got me in Fangoria. I mean, they, the traditional stuff they know how to do, they know how to do extremely well and they're very efficient at it. So they did a great job for Infected. Infected didn't hit the bestseller list, although the bestseller list goes from 1 to 35. We yeah, outsold yeah. 35, 34, and 33 that week, but it's not all based on sales at the New York Times. There, there are some other factors that they involve. So we were right on the bubble. Then when Contagious came out, um, the Crown did a little bit less for Contagious, but I was able to do more on my side. I, I, you know, I pimp it out on the podcast. The podcast community is very tightly knit. We all push each other's stuff if we like the stuff, and was able to just get more uh, more opportunities going. I got some help from uh, J.C. Hutchins, yep, who's yep. the author of Seventh Son, who's just a, a brilliant marketer, and he really got behind. We worked together to come up with uh, with some new strategies to help sell the book and it. Well, between Infected and Contagious, even though it was six months, the bottom was kind of falling out of the publishing industry. Sales were down all across the board. Contagious basically sold the same amount as Infected, yeah. but with the rest of the market dropping down underneath it, that was good enough to, uh, to get it on the, on the list. So the, I mean, the answer to the question is anything and everything possible is what you have to do to get a book on the New York Times bestseller list. And you know, Unless you're a J.K. Rowling or Stephen King. If you're mid list or trying to get on get on the list, you better be planning for four months of, of no sleep and doing everything humanly possible to promote the book. So it was really a, a four month run that you had, and then you did a book tour too. I, you did a tour of uh, how many cities did you go to? I know you were on the road for quite a while. But t talk about that. Like, what what did you do on the road, and where'd you go, and how long did you spend doing it? Well, we did five five cities for infected, yep. and you know because of the online audience, we were able to draw like forty to sixty people to every every book signing. And that's a really large number right now. Um, and then for Contagious, Crown paid for five cities, I paid for six, and we turned it into an 11 city tour. And the numbers were just, again, it just, you know, it continues to build. Because of the online connection right. and actually talking to these people, we had, we averaged 65 people per reading. In DC, we had like 120. We were selling, uh, selling out of the copies at every bookstore, selling an average of 42 books per, per reading. So it was just, it was a really successful event. Um, 10 of those cities were, were right in a row. It was like 10 cities in 11 days. So that, that was really interesting. You know, you, wow. you, you go to the airport, you fly, you land. Uh, usually you're, you're doing the book reading. And then uh, pub crawls are a huge part of my fan culture. <laughs> Fans want to go out and have a beer. You know, who am I to say no to that? Yeah. So you go to the bar and you, of course, you lose track of time because you're talking to all these people who are really entertained by your work and are really excited to talk to you, which is you know gosh such a such a problematic thing to do yeah <laughs> you get home about two in the morning and you're up about six to go to the airport again and you just do that for 10 days in a row it was uh, it was awesome i was able to shoot a lot of video footage and put it together as kind of a, a thank you to the fans and i honestly i can't wait to do it again i was it ruined me and i was exhausted and i can't wait to do it again and add more cities to it for the next book but uh, now i want to talk about your book the rookie and the rookie is basically a football story set in the future with aliens and you know that kind of thing, uh, but the aspect of it I want to talk about is you originally submitted it to the iPhone App Store as an as an iPhone book, and it was rejected because of the language. But you later came around and uh, fixed that, and they convinced you. You normally aren't the sort of person who would go soft and you know change the language of your your art, but there was this was a special case. So I'd love to hear your this. This is a great story. You told this to me uh, offline. I'd love to hear you talk about it on the show. Why? Well, I saw what you're doing with the pocket independent as an app book, and I'm really, really excited about the concept of books on smartphones. So um, I submitted to the iTunes store, and they rejected it because of the language. I immediately got all up in arms because this is a place where you can go download a 50 Cent album. This is a place where you can download Rosemary's Baby, like full frontal devil, full frontal nudity, devil rape. I mean, you can just get anything on the store. And they're rejecting my book, which had no sex. It was just basically just had some, some bad language. And I contacted some people I know over at the, uh, the iTunes store and said, you know, I'm pretty upset about this and I'm going to make as big a stink as I possibly can because what you're doing is wrong. They said, just give us a chance to check into it. The person they wound up checking with was a, 
a woman who, who kind of runs what goes on the store, and she used to be an English teacher. She got the content of the book and said, you know, I, she, she said I should tone it down because that kind of book, um, football, crime, science fiction all together, could really help a lot of kids who flat out don't have anything to read just because they're not interested in wizards, they're not interested in sparkly vampires. Most of the young adult stuff um, is not geared towards, you know, jocks or anybody of that that area. Yeah. So she yeah. she she kind of came back and said, "You have an opportunity here to uh, to get to help get people reading." Well, I've been such a fan of watching what's happened with Twilight, how many people that has got reading Harry Potter. I said, "I right, you know it's it's worth a shot. I'll give it a try." And while I was working on that, I was out on tour with Contagious and had several um, several incidents where parents would bring up their their kid be it, you know, 11 year old girl, 13 year old boy. And they would say this, they would show me infected or contagious, but like this is the only book he's read this year. And it really had an impact on me. You know, so wow. I, I kind of realized like if I just tone down the language of this book, here's a real book with a really unique subject, unique content that could potentially get people interested in, in reading, which in this day and age is pretty tough to do. So I, I, I pulled my fans, basically I left it up to my fans. I ran a poll on the site, talked about it in the podcast and the fans was about 80 to 90 percent were in favor of toning it down because a lot of my fans wanted to be able to share my stories with their kids and they couldn't because right, right. I, my stories are so full of just this hor horrible language so the, all of those factors came together we re-edited rookie down we we're able to put it out on the app store um, and then that has turned into that's the version that we're actually going to put out in hardcover is the young adult version I and mean, we all we did we just pretty much just did a language swap we didn't change we didn't change anything, and uh, it's the same story. Just knock the language down a little bit. So now, would you classify the rookie as a YA book? I guess you would. I really would. I, I really would classify it as a YA book because basically it's a it's a coming of age sports story, um, and I think it's got some cool things that a lot of YA books don't have because it's not preachy and it's not judgmental. The main character is a football player in this future professional football league. He's surrounded by crime, surrounded by elements of the drug culture. He just ignores everything. He's focused on what he wants to do. So, it, it, oddly enough, I mean, coming from me, this is crazy. It winds up being, you know, a, a positive message yeah. uh, without without telling people, you know, just say no or you know, turn people in. It's just this guy goes and does what he wants to do. Everybody else does what they have to do, and and none of what they do affects him. So it, it's become a really cool book that way. And it's a pro football league, you know, 700 years in the future with aliens playing the specialty positions. That's yeah. Why is it? I love it. I think it's. I love the concept. That's a great concept. Um, now let's talk about. I want to still talk about the rookie a little bit more. You. So you're a New York Times best-selling author, mm -hmm. and you have a, a deal with Crown. But you still, with the rookie, you went and published it with a small press, or you did it yourself, I think, right? And this was yeah. after the success of uh, Infected and Contagious. So why did you do that, and and how did that work out for you? And and tell me a little bit about that that journey. Well, first of all, Crown Publishing, which is a division of Random House, um, is just gigantic. They had the opportunity to publish the rookie, and they chose not to. They want to keep my brand focused on, you know, the the horror the horror thrillers, you know, the Michael Crichton -ish, Stephen King s kind of thing. And so they had it. They chose not to. I said, "Can I publish it myself?" Uh, they said, "Basically, as long as it's not in any stores and isn't confusing the distributors and the and the retail outlets." They said, "Sure, no problem." So started to look into publishing it myself and looked at some of the, um, you know, like Lulu Press and, and Book Surge and just kind of felt that A, uh, the margins weren't there and B, the product was going to be too expensive for, for people if we went paperback and C, you couldn't really trick out the quality. So um, started basically have started my own small press and we were doing a 3,000 copy print run in hardcover with this gorgeous embossed cover and 16 color pages inside and it's just, it's, it's just tricked out to beat the band. It's going to be just a phenomenal, phenomenal product and uh, have been learning that publishing is a really difficult business and there's a lot of crap, a lot of crap you don't know about when you go to the store and complain how expensive that hardcover is. There's a whole lot going on and we just got to your show as a news, as a, as a news breaker. Hey, we just hey. got the, um, the case back. So this is what you get to approve uh, the inside of the book, what goes on inside the, the dust jacket and uh let's see which way we can flip it yeah just flip it the other way flip it the other way you had it right this there way? right there we go yeah, yeah and just so, hold it still for a second so we can read it so the rookie dark what is it dark ever ever dark overlord media <laughs> dark overlord media very baby. nice 
you're the first one to uh, break the story. That's that's what's coming out. And um, yeah, so we've we've sold through over half the order so far. Um, and I think we're once people get the books in their hands and see how just how cool these things are, we're going to sell through the rest of them pretty quick. And hopefully, we sell through a three thousand copy first edition and move on to a second edition. So this will be probably a smaller print run, but for you, probably a more profitable one, I would guess. Is that correct? Correct. It's it's a it's a factor of ten both ways. I mean, I will sell um, probably ten percent of the number of books I sell through Crown. Yep. And then at the same time, I'm making 10 times as much per book if we sell through everything. You know, we cover all the costs. So it's, um, it's really, as far as the author's concerned, it's kind of six of one and a half dozen of the other. But long term, what you're looking at is this is a seven book series. So over the next 10 years, I'll be publishing six more of these books. Uh, 10 years from now, I'll have my own backlist of books as people continue to discover me in stores through bestseller lists, through Crown's marketing, etc. They read through everything that's in the bookstores. They go on the web as everybody does nowadays, and they're able to buy this backlist of another story. That's where things, you know, this could wind up being something that potentially an, an author could make a living on. If you can develop a large enough audience, give them a product that they're happy to buy, and they, they feel content, they spent their money wisely. Over time, that can be that can become something you can make a living at. Which is really, I think, the goal for almost all of this is people just want to be able to make a good living writing books, and that's what I'm shooting for here. Yeah, that's, it sounds like. But this is interesting because you're another. I, I've used this word, entrepreneur. Uh, on a couple of the past shows, and you're uh, a, a huge shining example of exactly that. You're, you've reinvented. You, you've basically got a major. Not only most people, when they get a major book deal, they would just stop there. They wouldn't, you know, start experimenting with other ways to distribute their other books. Mm -hmm. And you've come up with a way to do this. You're right. This could actually build into something which makes you a lot more money even than the traditional publishing deals has made you so far. And right. you control all the rights, and, and you have full control over it. You don't have to deal with you know, someone else telling you no, or you know, pe people wanting you to do things differently. You can just do however you want. So it winds, up, it winds up being a great. It's a great partnership. I mean, Crown and Random House are doing what they do. They're awesome to work with. I mean, every step of the way has just been a total dream come true. And they're getting books in stores, and they're exposing new people to uh, to my to my fiction that would never hear about me because these people just aren't online, right? right. And then at the same time, I can continue because one book every eighteen months. That ain't gonna cut it with the number of stories that I want to tell. So uh, I'm I'm over here printing my own crazy, you know, future football crime stuff um, that Crown just doesn't want. But uh, in, in the end, everybody's happy. It's drawing customers from both sides to to buy the Crown books, and people will wind up buying the rookie books too. So it's so far, it's just a gigantic win-win for everybody. So when you use online media to promote yourself, um, I I know you're on Twitter. You know you're on Goodreads, uh, Facebook. What what works? I mean, what have what have you found? What, what have you found to be the most effective way to promote your books online? Right now, I'd say Facebook seems to be the dominant force. You know, you get on Facebook, um, and I'm 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 steering away from these fan pages, and you know, authors who are in like <laughs> sending an email saying, "Hey, Mark, why don't you come be my fan on Facebook?" That's just you know, that's that's silly. If people find you and they want to become your fan, um, they can do that. But the primary thing is your Facebook page seems to be the biggest thing right now. That's where I'm getting the most responses to things that I post. You're able to link different RSS feeds, so it becomes the central point uh, for people to, to find your stuff, comment, it, comment on it, and interact with not only you, but with each other. So next to, uh, the primary thing is your website, the author's website, which should be author first name, author last name, dot com. Nothing, don't name it after a book. Don't name it after a series. It's all about the author because that's the name that's going to be selling books for the next 20 or 30 years, not the name of an individual book. Right. And making sure that website is interactive and that fans can contact you there and you can contact them back and staying in touch with your fans. That's the biggest thing is your own branded website, then Facebook, then Twitter is turning out to be – Twitter is just – it's an anomaly, but it's pretty cool. I mean people are coming into Twitter and adding me as a Twitter friend. I'm able to do a response to each one. You know, where did you hear about me? And you can find out different trends you weren't expecting. Sometimes you find out you were covered somewhere you didn't know about. Sometimes you find out that there's a, an evangelist out there who's, who's pimping you and turning a lot of people onto your work, and you're able to go connect with that person. So Twitter's the biggest thing. MySpace seems to be way down. Goodreads is, I don't even have a handle on Goodreads yet, but it's, it's pretty impressive so far because that's specifically book readers. But um, overall, it's, it's, it's your site giving away free stories. Um, and Seth Harwood talks about this a lot. We run this class called Author Boot Camp, 
And uh, sometimes authors are too busy talking about the writing process or you know what they had for breakfast because a lot of mid-listers are now getting into blogging because yeah. the publishers yeah. are telling them they have to. So they blog about where I'm going on book tour. They blog about what they had for breakfast. They blog about what they're working on. They're not giving away any stories. And what uh, Seth and I and a lot of people are finding, the people who've been in this long enough, no one really gives a crap what you're doing. You're a storyteller. They want stories. If you give them stories in a consistent way, then they get more involved with what you're doing. So uh, really online still to me is about giving away free, free fiction, unabridged, letting the audience decide if that's something that they want to get behind or not, and letting them decide if that's where they want to spend their money or not. Do you, uh, how many friends do you have right now on Facebook? Uh, Facebook's like 2,700, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, okay, so it's about, and that's, I think that's how many are following you on Twitter, something like that too. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter uh, is, is uh, closing about 7,000 on Twitter. Oh, okay, so, so it's, it's double much easier, It's much easier for people to add on Twitter, and Twitter's the soup du jour right now too. A lot of people are jumping on Twitter that are, um, they're never going to come back. I mean, they're going to use it for a couple weeks and not come back. But the, main, the most important part is the people who add me on Twitter are getting a personal response from me. Maybe we exchange a couple of direct messages, a couple of tweets. Even if they go away from Twitter and never come back, they still got the memory of this author actually spoke directly to me. So uh, and that, that's what sets me apart from a lot of the big time authors right now. Now, do you actually, do you actually, t you actually tweet everyone who, who follows you on Twitter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's, it's about 40, 50, 60 a day. Um, and it's a, it's a big chunk of time. And some days slip by and it just, the backlog adds up. But pretty much right now, um, everyone who adds me on Twitter is going to get a personal response. And the same thing with Facebook. And, you know, it's, it's a time investment as in an author's career. I mean, it takes, when you've got 50 Facebook friend ads waiting for you, it takes time to go in and read each one of those profiles and respond to them and, you know, asking questions about what's going on, trying to understand uh, why your fans are, are taking the time to connect with you. But it, it pays off, uh, it pays off huge. When people get that response back from an author or any media person, band, band person, artist, it really makes their day. They're really happy. Yep. So, um, so we're almost running out of time here. Two last questions. Um, First one is a lot of the other authors that have come on the show have talked a lot about Scrivener, and mm -hmm. I'm curious: Do you use it? What do you think of it? Do you know about it? I use Scrivener religiously. I think it's a fantastic software suite for writing. There's a couple things that uh, I'm, I'm not thrilled with about it, but it's vastly superior to any other word processing program that I've seen. And I haven't used other uh, novel or fiction specific writing programs, um, but Scrivener is is great for my kind of stuff because. I write these really detailed domino effect plots with multiple storylines moving forward, impacting each other, and all converging on a central point. So each chapter, being able to just move chapters back and forth and reshuffle them, that in itself is an invaluable tool. And you can keep all of your, all of your research in there, um, and uh, it's, it's excellent. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things you can do with Scrivener that you just cannot do with Microsoft Word. So uh, what are you working on right now? Right now I'm working on Ancestor, which uh, gets to come to life again. First it was a podcast for free, and then it wound up being a print book uh, in 2007, the one that broke everything open for me. And now Crown bought up Ancestor and Earthcore to get them off the market so they could control, they could control the Sigler brand. There was only going to be infected and contagious and, and nothing else. And now that they bought those, and Contagious did really well, they were going in and editing up Ancestor, rewriting a good chunk of the story, and that's going to be out in hardcover in May. Oh, great! And yep. we're, and so let's let's get your URLs out there now before we go. What, what's your website, and what's your Twitter, and what's your Facebook? <clears throat> website is uh, scottsigler.com, s c o t t s i g l a r dot com. Twitter, twitter dot com slash scottsigler. Facebook, facebook dot com slash scottsigler. Pretty much, if you just search Scott, Scott Sigler and everything, <laughs> you're find everything. Which right. is another t another tip for any authors that are watching this. Go to every social media thing you can find. Just register your name, even if you're not going to do anything with it now, because you might find out later that it's awesome. Like when we all thought MySpace was going to be the big thing, and it turned out to be Facebook. I'm glad I reserved my name in Facebook. Yep, yep, great move. Well, Scott, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I want to give thanks to Mood Organ for the opening music, and also Jason Calcanis, who makes this show possible. This, this is Bibliotech. We'll see you next time. All right, thanks. Thanks.